Hello, and welcome to the You're an Asset podcast. I'm your host, Casey the Dollar. And on this podcast, we find out who is an asset in the financial industry and who's just an ass. What we're going to do today is I get hundreds, if not thousands of comments on my social media pages every single month from people like you listening to the show, but also people just watching my TikTok, watching my Instagram. And I don't have time to respond to all of them. Um, I wish that I did. I even have a social media manager who, shout out to Farida, she has gone from zero to a hundred as far as her knowledge on life insurance goes. And she does her fucking best um, to answer people's questions as well as she can. But there's only that still only makes two of us watching over every single comment and question that we get all over social media. So what we decided to do was use one of these episodes, possibly once a month, to get together a bunch of comments in the form of questions that I haven't gotten a chance to answer or that was just a really good question and we're going to answer them. If you like this idea, you have a question that I don't end up answering today, please put your question in the comment section and we will hopefully answer it in the next show. And something else, if you're watching the show on YouTube, would you do me a favor? If you think that I'm an asset, can be now or at the end of the show, will you put an emoji with the cool guy, the sunglasses emoji in the bottom in the caption? Please. I, I would really appreciate it. I would really appreciate it. And so would Farida. <laughs> um, but so without further ado, let's get into some questions about insurance that I think people are dying to know. Question number one. Can I roll a retirement account into an IUL? Fantastic question, right? And the answer is, I wish. I wish that you could. I wish that you could take a 401k, an IRA, a Roth, and roll it into an IUL. Unfortunately, because a 401k or a retirement account is a well-defined contribution plan, it has taxes that are due when you take income from the account. And the taxes need to be paid. Uncle Sam needs to get his money. And unfortunately, well, not unfortunately, the the IUL takes post-tax money and spits it out to you tax-free. You get a lot of tax advantages with an IUL. If you need to know more about that, you can go listen to the previous episode from last week where I talked about all three of the tax codes that mention life insurance. So can you roll a retirement account into an IUL? Unfortunately, you cannot. Because of the tax consequences, you would have to liquidate your 401k, your IRA, your TSP, your 403b, whatever it is, in order to get those funds out of the account and into an IUL. I am not saying you should do that. Um, I'm not saying you shouldn't do that either. It's very much a case-by-case -case situation. I have had people liquidate a 401k to move the money into an IUL. And I've had people not do that. It wasn't the right call. So if you have that question, you want to talk about it with someone who can help you figure out what your options are, please reach out. There's there's a lot of possibility when it comes to these re retirement accounts. Something else you can do with a retirement account is roll it into an, an indexed annuity. And that's another episode as well. Um, we got a lot of stuff covered so far. And this is only episode nine. But um, an index annuity is a great option for rolling over retirement accounts if you want to keep the money safe. Now, question number two, is it possible to convert a term policy into an IUL? It is possible. However, it's a very specific case, right? The term policy you have has to already come with the convertibility factor of being able to transfer into an IUL. Usually it's only going to be the same company into the same company. As in, if you have a Transamerica policy, a term policy, you want to transfer it over into a Transamerica IUL, you might be able to do that. I'm not saying that Transamerica has convertible term policies, just using that as an example. 
I do work with term policies that are convertible. You get a 10-year term within that 10-year period. You can convert into a permanent policy like an IUL, which I think is a fantastic thing, by the way. If you have the opportunity to get a term policy that's convertible into a permanent policy, you absolutely should do that because then you have that opportunity to not lose your cover, right? So it is possible, but a lot, a lot, I would say majority of term policies are not going to be convertible, right? There's a lot of carriers out there that offer term, no convertibility, Primerica being one of them. <laughs> but great question. If you want one of those, reach out to us. We can help you. Now, question number three, how old can you be to open an IUL? Two weeks old. A baby can have an IUL. Fresh out the womb, you can have an IUL. That means parents, if you're listening, your child can get an IUL. You can have them set up before they're even a month born. That means everybody older than two weeks, if you're living, walking around, breathing, you can get an IUL. There is no age restrictions on the front end, at least. But there are going to be limitations on how old you can be to get an IUL, to open an IUL. Some carriers have a cutoff of 75 or 80 years old, right? So that's on the back end. But on the front end, we are good to go. Two weeks old, we can open an IUL. Question number four, who sets up an IUL and what qualifications should they possess? Your girl, Casey, sets up IULs. The team of Power3 Financial sets up IULs and our qualifications are that we have a life insurance license. I personally have 47 licenses, as in different states. I can do business in 47 out of the 50 states. And you'll have to forgive me. I can't remember what the third state is that I don't have, but it's it's New York, Iowa, and something else. I need to find that out. But whatever the other state is, there's... It's just that I haven't done business there. Back to the question, what qualifications do you need to to sell insurance? You just need a life insurance license, which I'm going to say it again, like fifth episode that I've said this. It's not that hard to get your life insurance license. They don't teach you things about IULs in your life insurance exam. It is very much general information um, about whole life and term policies and how the industry works and different things about like anti-money laundering, right? And not to not to scam people, which you think that being like one of the biggest parts of the quality or like getting your license, people wouldn't do that and they still do. But a life insurance agent sets up life insurance. Their qualifications are just the exam. Now, this question, it's a very basic answer, right? What it really comes down to is the knowledge of the person you're working with. Um, if you're able to trust this person and how do you find out if you can trust someone you find out what questions you need to ask them and and see if they're able to give you full knowledgeable answers a little bit tricky because like i said the insurance exam is not so difficult so then it comes down to you as the consumer really knowing what you need to know which if you need to know what you need to know that's why i'm here you come and listen to my Listen to the podcast, watch my TikTok. You'll find out all kinds of things that you need to know when you're going to purchase a life insurance policy. And I think it's more so on, unfortunately, on the consumer to really understand what they're purchasing and be able to be a good read of character and and feel out the vibe. Can I trust this person or not? What is my gut telling me? Because cash value life insurance specifically, it's a long-term commitment. It's a long-term commitment and you're putting your money there. You're, it's a contract. So trust your intuition. Don't be fooled by people who claim they're a financial advisor. I would say if someone tells you like, oh, I can set you up with a cash value life insurance policy. I'm a financial advisor. This does not make them any more qualified to sell you insurance. If anything, they're using a fancy title to make themselves look more professional when Really, financial advisors and life insurance agents are very different. And not that they shouldn't be blended, but I would never call myself a financial advisor. I'm an insurance strategist. I specialize in cash value life insurance. And so that right there, it goes to your honesty thing, right? Look for people who are honest. If they're trying to fool you with their financial advisor title. Next, next question. Let's see. Is it too late to start an IUL at 58 and would there be a medical exam? Great question. So we kind of cover that. It's not 
It's not too late to start an IUL at 58, for sure. The problem comes down to the amount of money you have to fund the policy, right? It might not make sense if you don't have the capital to fund the policy. So if you're 58, I would say it would be at least 15. Let's go with a safe 20 times your age, right? So if you're 58 years old, I'm going to say around that $1,000 a month range would be kind of the minimum you want to be at for for funding an IUL um, and just now starting it because cost of insurance gets more expensive the older we get. And overall, that means the size of the policy is going to be bigger. It's going to be more expensive. You need to put more money into it. And if you want a income from the policy, if you are focusing on cash accumulation, you got to get as much money into the policy as possible, cover those those fees, and then hope that we're, you know, hopefully we're earning 7 to 9% um, interest each year. But if we only did, say, that $500 range per month, six grand a year, we just won't see a substantial amount in the cash value. And if that was your goal, I would say it's not worth it anymore. But if you can put a large sum of money into the policy each year, people start IULs in their 50s to 60s all the time. So it's not too late. Just depends on what kind of money we're talking about. And then would there be a medical exam? So myself as a 28-year-old, I did a medical exam, okay? I just had a client this morning who's 46, no medical exam, done, passed through. I know other clients, they're in their 50s, um, 50s to 60s, no medical exam. But then a 17-year-old uh, had to get a medical exam, right? It totally depends on you, your health, um, your medical history, and what you end up filling out in your application to get the policy. So medical exams are absolutely case by case. There's no way for me to know, like, would there be one? And most of the more reputable companies are going to want a medical exam. If they are more likely to require a medical exam, their product is probably a little bit better, right? The, not that we need to jump through hoops, but when a carrier is particular about who they insure, that means they know that they have a good product, right? So I don't mind doing a medical exam. Like that means I, I'm getting a product that's good that maybe other people won't have access to, right? I think that's a good rule of thumb. Like if a IUL carrier is just like, oh, you're approved, you're approved, you're approved. I bet the cost of insurance on that product is way higher than the company who's really doing all of their checks and balances to make sure that you're approved for the policy. Okay, question number six. If one decides to terminate their current policy, would they get their money back? Depends on when we're talking about in the life of the policy. If we're talking about year one, no, you're not going to get your money back. You might get some money back, but years one through 10, there's going to be something called a surrender charge, which is usually a 10% penalty on all of the money you've contributed to your policy and everything you've earned. So if you contributed 30 grand, it's year eight, your cash value has 30 grand in it. They're going to charge you 10% of that cash value. So you're never, um, you're never going to get all of your money back. Unfortunately, even if it's, let's say it's year 15, um, you've contributed 50 grand, you have, a hundred grand in your policy, you want to cancel, they're going to give you your money back, but now you're going to pay capital gains tax, which is why life insurance policies are a long-term commitment. You should not be considering canceling. Um, now, I understand there are situations where like you have to cancel the policy. Maybe it sucks. And if the policy sucks and that's why you're canceling, you're definitely not getting your money back, unfortunately. It's not something where you can say, hey, like I want to cancel I, I just don't want the policy anymore. I, I want to take my money back. It's because, let's say you've had a policy for seven years. That whole time, you had a death benefit over your head. If something happened to you, the insurance carrier was going to pay you out money, meaning they had to have the capital ready and waiting to be able to pay out your beneficiary. It's not fake money that the insurance carrier is saying, hey, like, we'll give you this death benefit. They have to make sure that they have that money, meaning they have to make sure that it's a good deal for them, too. So when you cancel like halfway through your policy or in the first 10 years, they've spent a lot of money 
to make sure that they can offer you the benefits that you signed up for. And if you decide you don't want them anymore, they still spent money to make those promises to you. Getting a life insurance policy is like starting a business with the insurance carrier, right? You guys are in business together. They're making promises to you. You're making promises to them. And if one party decides to dip out, the other party would lose. There's no way to refund the coverage that you had over your head. You know, like that coverage was there. And you have the opportunity to cancel your policy and get some money back. But it, it might not always be an equivalent to what you had. And if you have more in your policy and your policy is doing well, just going to say it again, like, I don't know why you would cancel it, right? You have an asset that's earning money tax-free and you can take the money out tax-free. You can leverage against your asset. Why would you cancel that? And why would you cancel the death benefit coverage that would potentially go to your beneficiaries, right? And not potentially, it would go to your beneficiaries. I just mean if you use all of the money in your cash value, you have these options. Use all the money in your cash value, have the death benefit go to your beneficiary. You have you have a lot there in this policy to just kind of cancel it and walk away. Okay, question number seven. <laughs> I love this question. Do you happen to have any advice for temporarily broke bitches that can't afford to max contribute to their policy? So first off, max contribution, right? She's asking if you can't do the max contribution, which if we're talking about a $100,000 death benefit, max contribution would be $6,000 a year. If you're a broke bitch and you can't do that right now, what I'm going to say is you don't have to have this huge policy, of course. You can get as small as a $50,000 death benefit. Um, the max contribution on a $50,000 death benefit is going to be somewhere between two and $3,000 a year. Now, if that's still too much, which I totally understand, she had in parentheses, student loans. I hear you, girl. And that's still too much. You're young right now. You're a temporarily young broke bitch. And I would say your best strategy is lock in your insurability right now. Get that preferred plus health rating that locks in the lowest cost of insurance possible. Deal with the underwriting. If you have to do a medical exam, do it now and don't do it later in four, five, six years when you're in a different place financially because you could get one of those term policies that I was talking about and start it now. A term policy can be anywhere from, you know, 15 to $30 a month. And when you're ready and you are no longer a broke bitch, you transfer that term policy into an IUL and you didn't have to go through underwriting. You don't have to do a medical. You guaranteed your insurability. You locked it in a while back. And now, even if something happened to you, even if, like, God forbid, you got cancer in the last four or five years, they still have to give you a permanent insurance policy, which I think is pretty cool. So any of my listeners out there who are like, I can't afford to 10 times my age, which is my recommendation for starting a policy, get a term policy, set up a strategy. And as soon as you're ready, you go, hey, look, I'm ready for an IUL. I have the money now and I don't have to do any of that medical exam nonsense. Okay? That would be my best advice for you, my friend. OK, question number eight. Can the institution you invest in default and you lose all of your investment? I only said the word investment twice in this podcast because this question said investment. That is not my words, okay? Life insurance is not an investment. You guys know that. You know I would never say that. But that's what the question said. So can the insurance carrier, right, that you open a policy with default and you lose all of your money is how I would word that question. and. The answer is that there are safeguards in place. If an insurance carrier completely goes bankrupt, goes under, another insurance carrier is already set up to swoop up that insurance carrier. They're going to buy all of the policies and they're going to keep all those policies in force. No loss to any of the policy holders. They, they have a commissioner's bucket, right? There's a, a pool of money sitting around in each state waiting for a life insurance company to go under, get, go bankrupt, something like that. And so they have they have things in place already to make sure that doesn't happen. And if you ever hear about a life insurance company going bankrupt, then you, if the next story you hear is that another company bought them. Now, I, I say this like it happens all the time. It, it doesn't, okay? Insurance carriers actually have been around for hundreds of years. And in the last 20 years, 400 
and I believe it's 460 plus banks have gone bankrupt and dissolved in the last 20 years. 460 plus banks have completely went under compared to four life insurance companies, four compared to 400 plus. And we're concerned about the life insurance company going on default, but not the bank. And we keep putting our money in the bank. It's wild to me um, when I when I heard this statistic. And you can look it up on Google. Go ahead. Google it. Google it. So so the answer to, co- to that question is no. No, we're not going to lose all of our money. Um, and the insurance industry wouldn't let this happen, right? They People would stop putting their money into insurance if if that was happening all the time. Question number nine. How do I know if the universal life policy I have had for 13 years is set up correctly? Well, a couple different things here, right? If you've had a policy for 13 years, you do have the option to switch it and transfer it to a new policy if it's not set up correctly. I'll just start with that. But how would you know? You would know because you could look at your contributions, right? If you've contributed $30,000 over the last 30 years, you would have a cash value of at least 30000 or more dollars, okay, if the policy was set up correctly. If it's not set up correctly, you're going to have a lot less cash value. Let's see. The death benefit option, you want to look for the death benefit option. If it says level death benefit, it's not set up correctly. Now, long term, it might have worked out all right, okay, if you were max funding it. Something else you could look for is something called the target premium. Um, you want to find the target premium on your policy. Let's say you've been paying three grand a year into this policy and your target premium says three grand. Policy was not set up correctly because like the name says, target premium, you're only contributing the target, the goal. When you want to overfund the target, that's called max funding your policy. So you can look for the death benefit option. Hopefully it says increasing or return of premium. Or you want to look for that target premium number and hope that it's a lot less than what you've been contributing. And then look at your overall cash value growth. If you've put in a certain amount and you don't have that amount, something's wrong, right? But being that you, this person's had their policy for 13 years, if you want to reach out to Power3 Financial, give us a statement of your policy. We can help you find out and we can help you figure out the best option moving forward. Because after 10 years, we start getting into this place where we have the opportunity to transfer the cash value of the policy to just hit myself in the face if you're watching this video. <laughs> we have the opportunity to transfer the cash value um, of that policy you have into a new policy, which could hopefully work out a lot better um, if that policy was not set up. And now you're in a perfectly structured policy where you also got some education on how the policy was supposed to be set up. Now, Question number 10. This person says, what if I have more debt than wealth? Last month, I broke even and I have a bad debt to income ratio. This question kind of goes along the same lines as like, should you invest or should you pay off debt, right? And most financial gurus are going to say, you should do both at the same time. Um, You're giving up, you know, vital years of investing. I'm using that investing word. You're going to contribute into your life insurance policy. Um, not invest, right? It comes down to you, like how much debt are we talking about, right? Because it might be along the same lines as my temporarily broke bitches who need to just get a term policy and wait until they're in a better place. I don't think that max funding and IUL when you have a lot of debt, especially high interest debt, is a good idea. Because life insurance is not an investment, right? It's a product that you're buying. You should be getting it first and foremost because of the death benefit and to protect your family or any potential loss of income due to sickness or injury, right? And then the ability to max fund it and gain interest is like a a bonus. So if you if you have a lot of debt, I would say pay off your debt, get yourself into a better situation. If you want to get a term policy for the right now to have that in your back pocket, great idea. Our friend McCall Marshall says something really great. She she uses this line like, we want you to plan for your future without destroying your present. Basically, the life insurance policy should not be a stressful thing. It should be an exciting thing that you get to do and that you get to fund. But when that debt to income ratio is is breaking even every month, a term policy would be your best bet or actually doing, uh, actually putting your money into the market 
invest in something safe like an index fund. Um, and you'll have to you have to get information about investing into index funds from somebody else because I am not licensed to to advise you on that. Um, but that's what I would do. Now let's move on to question eleven. Our last question of the day. I posted a video on TikTok where this guy was talking about how he has like seven insurance policies and um, he's funding them a good amount, of course, right? He's a rich person. And somebody commented, it's cool if you have the savings to buy a jet or property, etc., and then pay yourself back. Otherwise, I don't get how it's useful. And I really appreciate this this outlook on it because... It, it's true. It seems like rich people can really take advantage of cash value life insurance. They have all this extra money. They throw it in there. They go out and they buy themselves real estate. They buy themselves a jet. That's what that guy was talking about in the video. And how is your average person going to get any use out of this? Well, if you ask me, let's say it's three years into your policy. You've been contributing six grand a year. That's $18,000 you've contributed. You're going to have a cash value of over 10 grand. Okay. And that money, you have access to it. You can loan it to yourself at any time. You can leverage your asset. Now, let's say that your car breaks down and you have a $3,000 car bill that you have to pay. Your options are take the money from your savings and deplete your savings or loan yourself the money from the cash value of your insurance policy, leverage your asset and pay yourself back slowly over time. That's where we have a real life example of, hey, I don't have to take this cash and spend it. I can go leverage this policy, this policy's cash value, loan myself the money, not have to use my savings account, and then I'll pay myself back over time. And when you pay yourself back interest into your cash value life insurance policy, guess what? You are the one that gets the interest. The interest goes back to you and you could borrow it again. It increases the overall value of your policy. You, When you use a loan rate called a participating fixed interest rate, the interest on your loan, let's say a $6,000 loan has a 5% interest rate, that's $300. That $300 of interest gets to sit and earn interest with the rest of your money. So you're going to earn interest on more money than you would have if you hadn't touched the policy, if you hadn't have loaned money. So right there, a very small, very real life example that anybody could relate to. That's how it's useful. You don't have to think, I can't afford a jet. I can't afford to go get rental properties. Small scale. This can be a small scale. It doesn't even have to be the $3,000 broken down car that I'm talking about. You have a $500 bill. Leverage the cash value. Don't spend your $500 in savings. Pay yourself back, increase the value of your policy, and not have lost out on your cash. That is how this stuff is useful. I mean, and we could go into a million different examples of real life things that happen to people all the time where it's, do I use this five grand I have in my emergency fund? Or would I do I wish I had five thousand dollars in a cash value life insurance policy that I could borrow from myself? I know some people think that that sounds silly, but when you learn to take advantage of assets and leverage them, you start to realize, holy shit, our economy, the school system, the education system, it didn't teach us anything. We don't know how money works. We could be leveraging assets and growing our assets all by ourselves. And we don't have to go ask the bank for money. We don't have to put things on credit. I hope that helps. I hope that makes sense as far as why it's useful. And I mean, otherwise, long term, that cash value becomes a tax-free retirement income to you, right? You can take out money for the rest of your life from your cash value because you just keep earning interest on your account's value. And over time, it's several hundred thousand dollars, even a million dollars that you're earning interest on, and you get to live off the interest tax-free. That sounds pretty useful to me, right? If you need to know more about the tax codes that talk about life insurance, it's episode eight. It's the episode before this one. and. The rich shouldn't be the only ones that are taking advantage of this stuff, you guys. You don't have to be extremely wealthy to do things that the wealthy do. Um, I have plenty of clients who have really small cash values and they're pulling out $2,000 here or $5,000 there. And they're learning to implement these strategies all on their own in their daily lives. 
and take advantage of the benefits of life insurance. Okay, my friends, that is all the questions we have for today. I hope that this was helpful. I hope you learned a lot. Comment your questions down below if you have questions that I did not answer today, like I'm sure you do. If you think I'm an asset, put a little uh, sunglasses emoji in the comment section for me, please. And like and subscribe uh, to the podcast, to the You're an Asset podcast. You can find me on social media as Casey the Dollar. And you can find Power 3 Financial at Power 3 Financial on Instagram and TikTok as well. This has been the You're an Asset podcast where we find out who's an asset and who is just an ass. See you next week. Bye. The You're an Asset podcast is not giving financial advice. We are not licensed financial advisors, and our licensing is strictly in insurance products. The information that we talk about is specific to the products that we work with. We cannot guarantee that other agents will have the same product features that we discuss on the show.